Hi, Kieran. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. You are Kieran, Kieran Setia, if I've got that right. That's right. You're a, a professor of philosophy at, at MIT. You've written a few books, uh, Knowing Right from Wrong, which always comes in handy, uh, Reasons Without Rationalism, uh, and now recently published uh, a book we're going to talk about called Midlife, A Philosophical Guide, uh, published by Princeton University Press. Very nice, slender, readable volume. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, it, it gets into the midlife crisis from kind of a new angle, from a philosopher's angle. Now, it, it did induce a crisis in me because I realized I failed to have my midlife crisis and now it's too late because I'm past midlife. So that's oh. like an opportunity that is lost forever. It's a foreclosed possibility. Of course, it's characteristic of a midlife crisis to have exactly this kind of regret that you didn't do something and now you can't. But in my case... I don't even have the satisfaction of knowing that it's a midlife crisis. It's just a crisis. I, I, the, the truth is you can have it at any time. There's actually a wonderful line in Martin Amos's novel, uh, The Information, which is a novel about a midlife crisis, uh, where the, 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 the omniscient narrator says, if you don't have a midlife crisis, that is a midlife crisis. So, oh, I feel so much better now. <laughs> it's Catch-22 or it's uh, yeah. Fader Company. It, yeah, it, it, uh, you, you're, you're good either way. Well, I was going to say that, that the characteristics of the midlife crisis, which we'll get to immediately, do, do seem to be, uh, you know, things that can, can uh, accompany your, your, uh, your crises throughout, pretty much throughout your life. I mean, I guess at the very end, when you just like, I'm going to die tomorrow, that's a different kind of crisis. Uh, but, but until then, uh, partly because we never really accept how old we're getting, we, we mm -hmm. you know, we like you know, the, the, we, it always, I, it probably feels like a midlife crisis, uh, if you have it, uh, even at my advanced age. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this thing known as a midlife crisis. Now, you say in the book that you wrote this because you had a, a version of one yourself, starting when you were, uh, what, in your mid-30s, which was, I don't know, what, five or six years ago? Yeah, yeah. So tell us yeah. about your, your, your crisis by way of getting to the the question of what one of these is. Well, my crisis was sort of the, the, the classic first world problem in that I, I had uh, I had a stable family and career. I'd made it as a professor of philosophy and that I had tenure. Um, and I think, in fact, the academic career track sets you up for this because it's it's incredibly hard driving that uh, up through tenure, you need you, you're constantly needing to achieve the next big thing. And that was the point at which I took a breath and thought, uh, oh my God, I'm not really sure what I'm doing with my life. And I'm not sure, uh, what I think about a future in which I just keep doing this, like teaching classes, which was it's worth doing, you know, thinking about philosophy, it's worth doing. But the prospect of just doing that over and over again seemed extremely hollow. Um, and so I had this sort of moment of alarm of thinking, or more than a moment, a period of alarm of thinking, this is, this is exactly what I wanted. Uh, but it is not making me happy. Uh, something has gone wrong. And I mean, part of the solution for me or the immediate response for me was intellectual, was thinking, well, at least that's intellectually puzzling. Mm -hmm. but how, how could it be that I've got exactly what I wanted and yet I feel this sense of hollowness? Um, maybe I could think about that and that would at least be the beginning of distracting myself from the sense of, of having uh, run out of, of, of my life plan, having sort of come to an end. Mm-hmm. Okay, so which of the uh, which of the properties of the of the mid classic midlife crisis does that particular problem embody? And then what are the other what are the other properties? So I think it's helpful to to put set things out the way you just did, and I do think there's sort of many midlife crises. There isn't just one thing that happens. I think for me, two things were really especially salient. One was a sense of missing out, the sense that my options had narrowed. And it was really clear to me now that I had a mortgage, I had a family, what I was going to do was was constrained. And lots of things that I might have vaguely thought I was alternative lives I might have lived 
uh, I definitely had to let go of, or at least my relationship to those other possible lives I could live had to change in some serious way. That was a big part of it. And the other part of it for me had to do with a sense of uh, the emptiness of the sort of relentless pursuit of projects, the, the continual success, failure, and achievement, then you replace it, then you do something else, and the sense that life was kind of a, a grind of, uh, in which even success felt like a kind of failure. And so th th those two parts of it were very big for me. I, mean, I think another thing that people often deal with at midlife that is very challenging and challenging in different ways for different people has to do with regret and misfortune and sort of coming to terms with the ways in which one's past is not uh, the way you want it to be and you can't change that now. Um, and that was something I was also dealing with, but, but it, the story I just told you was one in which the primary elements I think were, are really about, about missing out, uh, the inevitability of missing out, the fact that you only have one life to lead and that, um, even if things go well, there's a, there's a kind of emptiness that can, that can afflict you. That's very puzzling. Okay. So the first part of your career was like kind of wanting to be a tenured professor, wanting to be a tenured professor, wanting to be a tenured professor. And then you became a tenured professor and realized this is all I can ever be. And it, it, real, I mean, realistically, not, not that it's impossible to change tracks, but realistically, this is, this is it. Absolutely, yeah. This, I, I felt like uh, there was a kind of change in my relationship to what I was doing and that I was no longer doing it because I wanted to do it. Uh, even if I wanted to do it, I was now, I had to do it. Like, basically, mm -hmm. this was the career that, uh, I, this was something I could do. I had, no, who leaves a tenured job? Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I had a mortgage and a family. So there was a way in which um, I felt constrained. And I think that's a common experience for people in midlife to feel like, in practical terms, making a change is extremely difficult. So, mm -hmm. so the prospect of sort of throwing it all over and saying, yeah, maybe I'll become, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, start a band or maybe yeah. I'll become a writer. It's very hard in practical terms to do those things. So yeah, that, that was a, so more of it. It's, it's interesting that both realizing a fundamental aspiration as you did when you became a tenured professor and failing to realize your driving aspiration, both can lead you to look back and start imagining, wait, you know, wouldn't it have been better if I had taken some other path, right? I think that's right. I mean, in, in a way, I think that, that observation is sort of a first step towards um, a kind of philosophical therapy for this, which is recognizing that, in fact, no matter what had happened, right? I, you know, there's no way things could have gone where I wouldn't be in a position where everyone isn't in a position to look back and think, oh, yeah, I missed out on things that really matter to me. Because um, unless very few things matter to you, life is going to involve uh, loss and sacrifice mm -hmm. and let, letting go of things. So I think, yeah, the thought, no matter how it goes, um, there, there isn't some magic life I could have lived in which there wouldn't be, uh, um, there wouldn't be alternatives that I had to let go of, I think is, is a step towards sort of re reframing the, that life situation in a way that's helpful. So that's that's one of the one of the the steps you you you, you recommend recognizing what we just what you just said is you were bound to you were bound to have this moment one way or another uh, uh, of uh, uh, whatever you had done the truth is you can you can imagine that you should have pursued some other career married somebody else but the truth is you were probably going to wind up imagining that regardless right exactly and that. And in a way, the, the fact that we're in a position to do that, like the, the, the possibility of appreciating the many different kinds of valuable things you could do in life so that no matter what you do, you can see that it excludes other valuable things is, is in a way positive. I mean, it will be, it will be a kind of um, uh, terrible indifference to the, the range of things that can be valuable in life not to sense that there are other things I could have done that would have been worth, worthwhile, not to think, well, if I'd been a doctor, I would have saved lives. As a philosopher, I am not doing that. Or if I'd been a musician, I would have uh, had creative activities in my life that I don't have. So I, I think recognizing that the only way not to have that is to think 
is to sort of limit your horizon so much that you so that you're not capable of appreciating very much is a way to to reorient the the experience and sort of reframe loss as a kind of side effect of something good namely the human capacity to appreciate uh, a, a great diversity of, of values okay now before we uh talk more about what can characterize a midlife crisis and uh what to do about it um why don't we talk about how how real a phenomenon it is in 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 the, in the sense of I mean if it happens to you it's real but I mean I, I guess I mean kind of how uh, how predictable it is um, you know a, as you point out in the book this this only became a thing kind of in the I guess mainly in the seventies there were some there were some kind of academic treatments of it and then there was a wild bestseller Gail Sheehy's book Passages. Yeah. Uh, and I think there had been in the sixties, I think it had been probably discussed, but in the seventies, it real the mid, the midlife crisis really became a thing. And, and, and then there've been arguments, I guess, over like, how much of a thing is it? I mean, how likely is it to afflict you? Uh, are there gender differences? Um, and, and so on. So what, what, what do you, how, how real, how real is it? How, how, how predictable, how pervasive? So the, the, the sort of potted history is something starting off from the seventies where the, the sort of stereotypes emerged is something like this. The, the sort of initial stereotypes were heavily gendered. So, um, and this was partly to do with the fact that in 1974, when Gail Sheehy was working on the book, the women she was interviewing, the majority of them hadn't gone to college. They had a di very different kind of, in the U.S., had a very different kind of career trajectory than men. The, the sort of two main things that happened after then were in, in the 90s, culminating around 2000, there was this uh, gigantic survey um, sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation um, called Midlife in the United States. And that was extremely rosy. So the, the, the results of those kind of survey interviews were... Um, in general, things just get better and more stable and your relationship gets stronger through midlife. And so there was a kind of moment of, of debunking of the midlife crisis around 2000. And then the most recent wave of research um, is by economists. And what they, they study is um, reported life satisfaction at different stages of life. And that has sort of restored faith in the midlife crisis in a way, although I think it's also changed the meaning of the midlife crisis. So what the economists find, um, both for men and women uh, all, all around the world, is that um, life satisfaction by age takes the shape of a sort of gently curving U. So it starts high in youth, bottoms out in your 40s, roughly, and then ends higher in old age. And so uh, the question of how that sort of U-curve shape relates to crises or sort of moments of... of uh, uh, intense difficulty in midlife is uh, that's another question and that's that's a further complication but the idea that midlife is fairly pervasively a period of relative um, discontent with life mm -hmm. is supported now by by about 10 years of reasonably robust social science of course there are a lot of potential sources of discontent in middle age i mean for example there's just some correlation, I'm sure, with the likelihood, and this may be differ according to gender, but the likelihood of your having, say, adolescent kids or whatever. I, I don't know what the correlation might be, but that's an example of a variable that could correlate with age yeah. per se and, and and where the dissatisfaction could just derive from, like, you know, the fact that adolescents are a pain. And, and, and so... Um, so, I, I mean, what, what do you – and I would also assume that if you look at the data more closely, some relevant differences might emerge. There may be gender differences. It may be that if you look at women alone, it matters whether they pursued a career. That may mm -hmm. matter for men, but maybe in a different way. I mean, what, what – uh, have, have people drilled down on that correlation in, in a way that is illuminating? So the answer is that the economists have, have – done a lot of these sort of regression analyses to try and factor out the causes. Some of them I know about, some of them I don't. So one thing in particular about uh, parenthood, they, they, the original paper in 2008 does a, does a regression analysis to sort of factor out parenthood. And uh, it looks like the, the, the U shape for both men and women um, is sort of independent of whether you have kids. So uh, it's not 
that the hypothesis that it's it's attributable um, largely to the stresses of parenthood is um, doesn't seem right. It seems like it 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 happens whether or not you have kids. Okay. Um, the this the question of how it splits in detail in terms of um, the male female split. I'm actually not sure how what the fine grained data looks like. What I know is just that it, it does show up in terms of the rough mm. shape right. uh, for men and women um, is is roughly the same. I, uh, beyond that, um, uh, the data is fairly the, the the data I know is fairly coarse grained. So in one way in which it's um, coarse grained is that that there is this shape in happiness is there's a reasonable amount of data for questions like why is there so can we can we figure out which factors are predicting it that kind of research in the social science is still at a very early stage mm-hmm. um, I mean the most the most sort of intriguing thing that I've seen on that front is that there's a uh, some work by a German economist Hannah Schwant um, that traces not only people's life satisfaction by age but also um, people's expectation of what their life satisfaction will be in five years time. And he finds that young people overestimate how happy they're going to be uh, when they become 30 and 40 and 40 and 50 year olds underestimate how happy they're going to be, how satisfied they're going to be with life later. And he, his suggestion is um, part of what explains the, the sort of U curve is that is a sort of uh, unrealistic expectations for what midlife is going to be like. And then, unrealistically pessimistic expectations of how mm-hmm. bad old age is going to be. And that there's some support for that hypothesis. And that sort of fits, yeah. that would fits the sort of stereotypical understanding of what's going on in the midlife crisis is that it's disappointed ambition. So it's to some extent oh, a, re- a result of, uh, of elevated expectations. Yeah, there, there's some evidence for that, but mm-hmm. I, I should say that hypothesis is one of the few sort of credible attempts to, to come up with an explanation that has some kind of, um, uh, empirical backing. Mm-hmm. Really, I think that the attempts by social scientists to explain this are still pretty in pretty early phase. Yeah. Um, now, on gender, I would expect some difference, if only uh, on the grounds that you know a kind of <clears throat> a kind of foreclosed opportunity you can have. And again, part of the midlife crisis is the sense that your 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 options are narrowing as you move forward. Um, one version of that is having kids and, and it could be you haven't had them and you'd like to have them. It could be that you've had them. You don't think it worked out well. And you imagine finding a new mate and having them again. Well, if you want them to be your biological kids, of course, for yeah. men and women, it's a very different story at age 40 to 50 and, and at age 50 to 60 and so on. So I, I, I would expect on those grounds alone and maybe on other grounds that you actually would uh, find differences there that sounds quite plausible i mean some of the one of the case studies um i take up in the book is that is virginia wolf reflecting as she does in her diaries on the sort of contrast between her life and vanessa bell's and the the crux of that is the sense that uh vanessa bell has kids uh virginia wolf doesn't and that's a kind of lost opportunity and that there's a kind of part of what's uh, bothering Wolf or sort of obsessing Wolf is the way in which children uh, have a kind of potentially redemptive quality in, in Vanessa Bell's life that uh, she's wondering whether the alternatives to that in her life, so writing novels in the way she did, could have. So I think um, it wouldn't be at all surprising anyway if that, that kind of uh, biological sort of process, uh, the biological limitations to when women can have children makes that particularly uh changes the shape of the sort of midlife experience for for men and women that that seems right right to me um but in any event initially the stereotypical midlife crisis was kind of a male thing the 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 stereotypical reaction to a midlife crisis was to buy a sports car or leave your wife or both or do something comparable and I guess, you know, part of when I say I don't think I had a midlife crisis, part of part of it is just that I didn't do any of those things. And I don't <laughs> um, doesn't mean I didn't want to. And I may be I may be glossing over uh, the, the midlife crisis. I, in fact, had memory. I don't think is that reliable. I mean, it may be that if you had surveyed me every year, there would be this kind of dip or something. Right. But I also think, you know, it, it is to some extent it may have to do with career 
path in the sense that your career is like some careers where there's a point where you've made it. It's like becoming a partner in a law firm or, you know, becoming, uh, you know, there are various, uh, it, it's, it's rarely as binary as it is with tenure or with becoming a partner, but there are a number of uh, career paths, and I think there used to be more, where you would be within a given institution and working, and there's some level of stature at which you, you both kind of realize, well, this is, you know, this is uh, kind of what I wanted, and where you realize that, wow, I guess I just kind of stay in this place now. I never had that by virtue of the nature of the the business I'm in, so to speak. Uh, I, I guess you, there's no no data on this, though, right, correlating with, with career? Not that I know of. I mean, anecdotally, I think what you're saying rings rings true to me and rings true in talking to friends about this. I think that I think a lot of the people I talk to about this are academics. And I think mm -hmm. the feature of the academic career shape you're pointing to induces this sort of uh, partly it's because it's also you have to work so hard to get there. Your head is down. You're not sort of stepping back to reflect on what you want to do with your life. You're just trying to get tenure. Right. And then there's a kind of thought, well, I made it and now I have a moment to breathe. And I realized I haven't actually had the, I haven't stepped back to ask whether this is what I want to do for about 10 years or 15 mm -hmm. years. Um, so I think the career, that particular career shape is, is probably maximizes your chances of having this stereotypical kind of midlife crisis or becoming partner in a law firm. Or I think those things have a similar shape. Um, and I think you have that with having kids too, because there's a kind of point right. at which either you did it or you didn't and, or it's a fuzzy point, but it's certainly right. there's a kind of confrontation with that that can have a, a, a come into focus at a certain age. Um, and yeah, I mean, so you've been a writer since your whole. Is that something you've been doing? Pretty your much. Whole I mean, I, I've had brushes with academia. I've actually taught uh, occasionally, but I'm not really a credentialed academic. And I've had. I, I mean, you know, in the old days, I would be like actually working at a periodical. Uh -huh. uh, like, but then at some point I just went kind of on my own and, and it's been very improvisational since then, I guess. And a series of, you know, fluctuating affiliations that, that maybe brought some money and freelancing and writing books and so on. So it's just been more yeah. fluid. And, 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 and so and maybe it's good that you, you, you never, you, you're never taking it for granted. You always, you know, you always have to figure something else out. But do you have a version of this? So one thought you might have about, say, the shape of, of a writing life is, is quite similar. Namely, there's a kind of the project of writing a book. Uh, it's not like a 30-year project, like getting a PhD and getting tenure and getting a job. But it's nevertheless a fairly substantial long-term project at the end of which you're done. Yeah. And I mean, so, so I have that with, uh, in microcosm with writing books. I have this sort of moment of the, the sort of ambivalence about finishing where right. I really want to write the book. But at the end, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to have to let go of this and there'll be this this void. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it, it, maybe you don't, I don't know if everyone has that when they're writing or, um, or whether whether you always have a, whether maybe you already have. You I wouldn't have say I'm thing. enjoying the process so much that I <laughs> that I worry about letting go of it. I see. There's a I related see. thing that like you're working on a book and you think it's the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's a subject you think is urgently important, important. Your treatment of it you think is pretty good. And then you publish the book and you find out that that opinion is not necessarily widely shared. I mean, somebody once said that the, 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 uh, the period right before the publication of your book is the calm before the calm, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like yeah. you're waiting. And, and that's, a, that's a kind of a common thing among, among writers. And, and that's, that, that's the, I mean, you, 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 you quote, what's her name? The singer who wrote, uh, who sang famously, is that all there is, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, that is a, a, a is that all there is moment um yeah. and and it's you know and we've all had those i think w and in a way i think of an important distinction is between the macroscopic the more macroscopic long range versions of that and the microscopic so like mm -hmm. eating a donut is a version of that you mm -hmm. look forward to it you eat it and wait it, that was quick and now i just want another one yeah. But but it's but 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 these crises you're talking about deal with the more kind of ma larger scale uh, versions of the same experience. Yeah, I think that's right. So so um, yeah, write, writing a book might be one example, but also getting a promotion at work or th things that sort of uh, uh, or um, uh, you know hooking up with someone like th things where you're you're there's a kind of re yeah. reasonably substantial. Imp 
consuming kind of project in life, I think, um, can generate this sense that success feels like failure. That once you're done, you, you feel like the, the, uh, there's a certain kind of disappointment. Um, and I'm interested in sort of understanding what it is about the structure of those kinds of activities that generates that. And I think, you know, that they happen on a larger scale when, uh, they're sort of the same thing writ large when you have this sort of vocational structure where you're trying to be promoted to partner or have kids mm -hmm. where that's something that's occupied you for many, many, many years. That's, um, around which you've made a, a lot of life decisions, like sacrifices you make in order to have kids and so on that, uh, make it especially troubling if when you achieve what you've set out to achieve, you think, huh, I, I sort of anticipated this being a kind of stable source of satisfaction, but in right. fact, it, it just feels like I'm, I'm, I'm done with that now. Right. Uh, and I'm just wondering what next. Now you, you have, uh, recommended, um, remedial measures, you know, you have, uh, there are various prescriptive aspects of the book. We've kind of touched on some of them. Let's hold off on the one in the kind of the final uh, big chapter, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise for me, but but well, but but um, in a good way. I mean, I was I was happy to see it. But uh, but let's start off by um, before we get to that, let's uh, say a little more about the book. So you're a philosopher, and there's a couple of senses in which this is a philosopher's treatment. Or, or uh, uh, one is that you you deal with these questions, you know, philosophically, and you draw on the ideas of philosophers, but you also use philosophers as examples. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they have lives like everybody else. And so why don't you start out with the John Stuart Mill case, which is early in the book. Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, this is a case that was very inspiring to me and as a model for a philosopher reflecting on his life, because Mill, um, John Stuart Mill was a 19th century philosopher. He was, uh, influential as a, as a social activist, as well as one of the great utilitarians. And uh, he had this incredible early childhood, well, incredible may not be the right word, inc inc extreme childhood in which his father uh, decided that he was going to be an activist and he was going to have the most uh, effective education possible. So John Stuart Mill learned Greek at age three. He was reading Plato by seven. He learned Latin at eight. He was then basically doing the equivalent of a university degree in his teens. And by the time he was 20, he had a nervous breakdown. Um, so he had this sort of accelerated crash uh, uh, experience that many of us only get to if we get to it at all much later. And Mill is interesting because he later wrote an autobiography in which he tries to figure out what was going wrong with him. And it's, it is relatively unusual for philosophers in the sort of Western tradition I, I work in to write, um, less, certainly over the last 150, 200 years, to write memoirs like this. Uh, and so Mill says two main things about his life that I think are really illuminating. One is uh, that a key to happiness is not exclusively pursuing happiness. That if, if you're just pursuing happiness, uh, that will preclude investment in other activities. And it's investment in things other than your own happiness that provide the sources of happiness, I mean, also of vulnerability and also of, of risk in life. But um, that idea that philosophers call this the paradox of egoism, that if you just pursue your own happiness, your sources of happiness will be contracted, was one of the things that he drew from his experience. And the other, which I think is very illuminating, was uh, his crisis was sort of prompted by thinking, suppose I make these changes in society that reduce human suffering. What are we going to do then? And he realized his picture of a good human life and what we, what we were pursuing in life was sort of purely negative, uh, sort of a double negative. It was reduce human suffering. But if the best you can do in life is to reduce suffering, what's the point? There has to be something positively good. And, and that was a revelation that the sort of distinctive category of things that are not just ameliorative, but positively good, things that really add make life worth living in the first place. For him, it was Wordsworth's poetry. I think that experience is also illuminating because even if you're not like Mill, you're not having this crazy childhood, the, the sort of sandwich generation experience, the experience at midlife that an enormous amount of your time is devoted to ameliorative activities, like making sure the kids are doing okay and taking care of your aging parents and just all things that are worth doing, but they're basically 
ameliorative rather than um, sources of sort of further positive value. I think that experience is a common one at midlife, and that's one that Mill's predicament connects with. Okay, so you make the distinction between ameliorative ameliorative and existential in that's right in yeah. this context, right? So ameliorative value versus existential value. So what is what does it mean to pursue something of existential value, or is, is pursuit even the right word? If if in that case, yeah, I mean, so the I think the the. Uh, Pursuit seems seems fine for many kind of activities with existential value. Like it might be writing an opera or listening to an opera or um, uh, playing a game of Monopoly with your kids. And some of these things seem kind of grand and some seem trivial. But the common factor is they're not just means to an end. And they're not just valuable because they make things less bad than they would otherwise be. They're not just solving a problem we'd rather be without. Um, and... The, the ameliorative values, things that are just ameliorative, they, they, they're often not just instrumentally valuable. It's not just as a means to an end that human suffer, it's worth reducing human suffering. But nevertheless, if what you're doing is curing a disease, say, mm -hmm. you're engaging in an activity that responds to a problem that ideally we wouldn't have to deal with. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have the disease that needs to be cured. Uh, so there's a way in which ameliorative activities, while valuable, are not things that we would make sense to do in an ideal world, whereas existential values, activities with existential value are things that, trivial or profound, don't just solve a problem, but even if you didn't have any problems to solve, right. would still be worth doing. So even if you were in heaven, so to speak, you might you might play games with your kids, and you might, uh, and you might write operas. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Not because everyone around you was miserable and needed an opera, to go to but but and not and i gather not even necessarily because because they would go to it and and enjoy it uh but but something about the very endeavor itself of writing it that's the idea although even if, i mean aiming at people's positive enjoyment is that, is, that would also be an existential, that is also existential. Value, but, but the thought is um you're not just trying to prevent them it, the contrast you draw really matters is if it's just that people are demoralized and they need some need to rewind need to sort of rewind so that they can or unwind so that they can get back to work. An opera will help them do that. Then it's just ameliorative. You're just mm -hmm. sort of trying to help people get over a problem that will enable them to get back to something else. But if people are going and listening to music or spending time with friends, not in order to solve a problem, but for the joy of it, then that would be an example of of an activity with existential value. Um, and I think yeah the, the Everyone, it, it, people rarely are in a situation where their neglect of existential value is as acute as Mills. But it, it's rare for someone to be in a position where they literally haven't sort of conceived of any goal in life other than reduce suffering. Right. But I think th th forms of this that are less extreme are quite common. P people who feel that the experience in midlife of feeling like you barely have any time to, to do the things that you want to do but don't need to do because so much of your life is consumed. There's so much pressure to uh, uh, keep up with things that have to be done because if yeah. you didn't, then things would fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that, that experience is uh, in a way a kind of mundane version of the, of the John Stuart Mill mm -hmm. nervous breakdown. Now this thing, the kind of paradox of egoism or whatever the, your exact phrase was, is that related yeah. to the fairly robust uh, finding, I think, in contemporary psychology that people tend to be happier if they are engaged in community activity, if they are, you know, whether and, 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 and so on. I, I mean, people doing things other than obviously strictly hedonistic things tend to be happier. I think the answer is basically yes. I mean, I think that the sort of philosopher's paradox uh, doesn't necessarily suggest that particularly communal or sort of social activities will be especially effective. It does suggest that if what you're just pursuing is your own your own happiness, that is going to be threatens to be counterproductive. Um, but it's at least consistent with, and it definitely fits very very comfortably with the the uh, studies you're you're right. describing. Yeah. Right. Um... Okay, so um, and then so so and and this I, I guess like that paradox, kind of afflicts people at at all ages, right? I mean that 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 can be mingled in 
with the other elements of midlife crisis. But that's like a good life lesson. You would tell somebody who's 20, like, if you just if you just pursue pleasure and happiness per se, single-mindedly, you're less likely to, to, to find happiness. That, that's just good advice. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that 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 is a uh, both a, a kind of general sort of puzzle about the the exclusive pursuit of one's own happiness and a kind of um, particularly poignant puzzle for people who are thinking about writing self help because of course the the, the point of a self help book is in a way to address people who are seeking happiness right. and the first thing to say is <laughs> well you may have to throw this ladder away. Yeah. I mean ultimately <laughs> you shouldn't being invested in things other than just pursuing your own happiness is going to be part of the solution. Right. Um, the self-help is sort of a, it has to be a kind of patch rather than a... So um, it's like, n- now that you've bought my book, I can tell you that you should never again <laughs> buy a self-help book. It's the wrong path. That's, that's the, the <laughs> exactly. That's the kind of guru I aspire to be. Like once <laughs> yeah, well, you bought my a, book, it's a good business don't... model. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, yes. Although I, I, I had the sense that like a lot of self-help writers... Um, they want you to buy the next book and the next book too. Yeah, so, you do have so, to. You do have to set up your sequel, but it can, uh, in principle, if you're a good enough guru, be something other than a self help book. I see. You move on to stage two at that point. This okay. is my advice yeah. to you, young man. <laughs> okay, I will. I will try to try to conceive that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, a, it, It's one of the ways in which working on the book was sort of um, uh, uh, the, the sort of question of how, how to occupy the role of of giving advice, which is sort of a, a weird one for a philosopher, because philosophers often don't don't want to be directive in that way. But in particular, being directive in helping, trying to help people to think about their own happiness, mm-hmm. when the first thing you have to say is, well, you know, that may not be the right goal is, uh, uh, well, I get that out of the way right at the beginning. So mm-hmm. uh, there's that. Okay, so Mill, like I said, you 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 get into Mill and this whole the business of egoism and the, the 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 problem he confronted kind of early in the book. In the middle of the book, I would say you talk about more what we started out talking about the more classic elements of the midlife experience. These kind of closely related things of like a sense of uh, constrained future options, the kind of feeling of is that all there is and a kind of retrospection that leads you to wonder if you shouldn't have taken other paths and maybe regret not taking them. These things are very closely related. Um, now, is there yeah. anything uh, you want to say that that's uh, that we didn't already say by way of what you recommend? I mean, there, there are things in, in the book that we haven't said about how you recommend uh, handling this this kind of cluster of problems, right? Well, I think the w- one thing that we didn't touch on before that I found very interesting was was a connection between these experiences and uh, a thought experiment that philosophers have talked about a lot in in somewhat somewhat related contexts, um, which comes from Derek Parfit, which is the, the the temporary condition thought experiment. So this is this is supposed to illustrate a, the ways in which um, one's retrospective attitude to an event can come apart from the attitude you should have had at the time. So cases where there's something you shouldn't have done at the time or you should have disapproved of at a certain time that later it can be rational to approve of. So that it's sort of an optimistic thought because it makes you think, well, maybe there's a way to change change my retrospective attitude to to past mistakes. The example he he talks about is one in which um, a woman has a temporary condition, which means that if she conceives a child in the next two months while she has this condition, it will have some health condition like migraines. Uh, and she thinks I should wait, but suppose she doesn't wait and has the child. She then later loves the child and is attached to this particular child, and she knows that this child wouldn't have existed right. if she had waited. And the thought is, well, maybe at that point, she isn't compelled rationally to regret a decision, even though though she admits it was a bad decision at the time. And now, now she can sort of retrospectively affirm, or at least be ambivalent about it. And so the, the thing I was interested in exploring was uh, how that works and how far that extends. So how far it makes rational sense for attachments, not just to the life of a new human being, but to activities in your life or uh, other things that you might care about, relationships, say. How far those kinds of attachments can say, play the same role in making sense of a sort of retrospective affirmation of events 
either decisions of yours or things that happened to you in the past that at the time were um, you should have you should have wished uh, not to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that's a point of contact that I found really intriguing that that I I, I think is worth pursuing between uh, sort of ideas in contemporary philosophy and this pervasive sort of phenomenon that people have to deal with of, of coming to terms with their past in midlife and figuring out how to feel about the past. I mean, there are, everyone's life has at least some positive things that they can plausibly believe they would not have if they had taken some other path. Right. And so the question is, how far, exactly, so how, the question is sort of, even when those things don't sort of outweigh the bad that happened, even when you think, but still on balance, it might have been, my life might have been better if I'd taken some other path. Can my attachment to the particular positive things in my life make sense of why I don't wish things had gone differently? So if I think, well, yeah, I could have had a better career if I'd made different choices in college and I kind of screwed things up then. But nevertheless, although it would have been better, right now, I, I even though it's not perfect, I'm attached to my career as um, uh, a doctor or my career as uh, a nurse or my career as whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to, for that attachment to sort of play a role as a counterweight to regret in the same way the attachment to the, uh, the child that, you know, it was a mistake to, to sort of <laughs> procreate um, cannot operate as a counterweight mm-hmm. to regret? And uh, I think it's quite tricky to figure out whether it can, but ultimately I think that, that um, it can be reasonable to rationally affirm decisions on the basis of your acquaintance with an attachment to the particular good things in your life, even when you acknowledge that in the abstract, it could have been better some other way. Right. Yeah. And does it do any good uh, for people to just reflect on the fact that it is just human nature to wind up having that is all there <laughs> the is that all there is feeling or to, you know, to look back longingly it's something they might have done and if they had done exactly what they're fantasizing about doing right now there's a really high probability they would still have the same feeling right yes yeah yeah and i I think there's definitely a tendency looking back at alternative decisions you could have made to not to not to remember the fact that that decision was both uh risky in ways that might have it might have turned out badly and that even if it had turned out pretty well you would still be in a position to look back at the other trajectory and think, well, what if I'd gone the other way and it had turned out uh, incredibly well? So um, I think you're right that 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 sort of thinking about the way in which this kind of reflection is inevitably going to be available mm-hmm. uh, can be can be helpful. I mean, it, it's a way. Of, I mean, it, it, at the simplest level, it's a way of recognizing that certain kinds of second guessing about your life. Uh, are not a sign that anything went wrong. Right. Um, they're they're a, just a function of of a human capacity to reflect and consider alternatives, and that uh, there's a real question about how much role that kind of uh, reflection on alternatives should play in our evaluation of the particular circumstances of our own actual lives. Right. Um, now, in a way, you're you're recommending a kind of selective reflection or a selective analysis right in in the i mean it in this th- sense that uh if you have children i mean you're pretty much bound to love them and if you ask yourself well would i want to have taken a path that led these children to not exist the answer is no because mm-hmm. we get attached to our children on the other hand the fact is if you had taken another path, maybe married somebody else, had different children, you you would feel that way about them. But you're kind of recommending that we not dwell on that so much as the as what we as what we do have that's positive. Right. The thought is that it it what happens in these cases is the fact that you know that were you to have chosen the other path, you would then be in a position to affirm it. Right. Uh, maybe affirm it. Uh, even more strongly, doesn't compel you to to sort of not affirm the path you've actually taken. It's 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 perfectly reasonable to let attachment to your particular children uh, determine your attitude to these past events. And I, mm-hmm. I think that is, um, I mean, 
I think it's both a, a natural human response and a reasonable human response. There's no, there's no, um, I don't think there's any basis for sort of second, sort of criticizing or, or, or being skeptical about the reasonableness of mm -hmm. those kinds of attachments to particular individuals. Um, I think it's just a feature of, of how human emotional life works that we do become attached, not just to, you know, there being some child that's my child, but to this particular child. Right. And I don't think that's a sort of regrettable feature of, of human emotional life. Right. So um, a lot of this, a lot of what we've talked about so far, I think, is embodied in a philosopher you bring in near the end and who kind of leads us into the uh, the final chapter I was talking about. I mean, there's a there's a little summary chapter, I guess, at the end, but, but the final uh, kind of substantial chapter, and that is, that is Schopenhauer. So yeah. you want to talk about about who he was and and how he speaks to some of these concerns? Yeah, so Schopenhauer was a, a 19th century German uh, philosopher, famously pessimistic, uh, famously uh, uh, attacked the idea of desire, so criticized desire as inherently and inevitably futile. And his his basic picture was that the problem of desire is that when you get what you want, you have nothing to do. So if you get what you want, you're going to be bored. So you've got to have desires. You need to have desires in order to not your life not to be empty. But thought Schopenhauer, the problem with having desires is that desires involve wanting things you don't have. And wanting what you don't have is painful. Mm -hmm. So here are your options. Either you want stuff and you don't have it. That's painful. Well, you don't really want anything. But that's intolerably boring your life has you have no no purpose in life and schopenhauer thought this is just a feature of of how desire works in general this is not a a, a problem to be solved exactly but um uh, an unavoidable aspect of the human condition or the animal condition in in general um and i think his diagnosis is is apt as a diagnosis of a certain kind of temperament that is particularly prone to a certain kind of midlife crisis, certainly mine, which is um, if what you're doing is investing meaning primarily in completable projects. Uh, and I think that was that was true of me when I was when my sort of at least in my work life, when my sense of how to engage with philosophy had been shaped professionally so that it was about achieving these sort of goals and milestones. The thought is um, if what you care about is achieving it's completing projects. You're aiming at goals in a way that means that satisfaction is always in the future, not yet achieved. And as soon as it's achieved, it's in the past, that you're done. And it's never sort of in the present. And your way of engaging with projects is, is sort of self-subversive because what you're doing is taking something meaningful in your life. And if it's a project, you're trying to complete it. So you're taking something that really matters to you. And what you're in effect trying to do is get it out of your life. Mm -hmm. The effect of engaging with it in that way is going to be to extinguish it and, and mean that it can't give meaning to your life anymore. And that, I think, is um, a kind of uh, temperamental approach or sort of mindset that I, I think generates one kind of midlife crisis. And I think is a central part of the diagnosis of my particular malaise was um, being incredibly strongly project oriented and mm -hmm. sort of pro driven in that way. Uh, and I think even if it's not, um, even if it's not unavoidable, Schopenhauer's account is a, is a good diagnosis mm -hmm. of that particular predicament. And, and, and again, there's like fine grained versions of it and large scale versions of it. And in a way, the classic mid, mid uh, midlife, uh, crisis, um, is, sees the project that's been completed as like the last 15 years and <laughs> it's like what right, now right. but but you know then there, there are these shorter time frame you know there are if you're a writer there are books there are articles there are emails there are you know it's always it's always something there are meals and so on and so you know schopenhauer was it was was addressing a, a very pervasive problem that exists at many scales and so this leads us to, to your 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 kind of uh you you end the book um talking a lot about mindfulness uh yeah, yeah. which has uh become a big thing um yeah. you talk about it in a buddhist context but then uh kind of take pains to separate 
uh, your preferred version of it from part of its Buddhist context. So you want to yeah. want to talk a little about that? Yeah. So for me, the, the sort of key distinction here that that Schopenhauer neglected is the distinction between what I call telic and atelic activities. So telic activities comes from the Greek word telos for purpose are the, the sort of goal directed ones, the ones that have a kind of terminal point, an end goal, things like getting a promotion at work or um, losing your virginity or having a kid or uh, things you can complete. Uh, and those are the ones that generate this problem that, that, that um, satisfactions in the future or the past and you're sort of engaging with them is, is basically extinguishing them. But not all activities are like that. There are also atelic activities that don't have this sort of goal-directed structure. So parenting as a, a sort of ongoing process or spending time with friends or family or just listening to music are examples of um, atelic activities. And so I think that a, a diagnosis of a kind of problem that can occur not just at midlife, but is maybe especially at midlife, is a kind of excessive investment in the value of telic activities or projects that neglects the value of atelic activities and, and therefore creates a sense of sort of hollowness that sort of satisfaction is always future or past and you're working against it. It's mm -hmm. not sort of materialized in the present. Whereas if what you want is to be listening to music or talking to someone, then you're doing it right now. There's no, there's not a sort of further thing that you could get beyond just the thing that's happening in the present. Right. And the way in which mindfulness comes into that for me is that uh, sort of having made this intellectual, reached this intellectual conclusion that what I need to do is to appreciate more fully the value of these atelic activities, then there's the question, how do I do that? How do I stop my uh, attention and my sort of evaluative focus from constantly slipping towards the achievement of goals so that I'm able to sort of a attend to the value of what's happening right now. And that's where, for me, um, uh, a certain kind of meditation, mindfulness meditation, can be helpful in sort of training uh, the appreciation of the sort of ongoing process in a way that that um, uh, is otherwise hard to achieve. Just deciding that I want to appreciate, for instance, thinking about philosophy, not just finishing this article, uh, just making that revelation is not enough to to sort of change my actual emotional experience of things um whereas sl slowly but but uh and fitfully meditation maybe is right no i think that's uh that's consistent with my experience is that it's it's with a lot of these things about improving your life or your sense of well-being um or your 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 moral conduct or whatever it's one thing to recognize the problem uh, and, 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 and understand what the shift in frame of mind would be that would, uh, that would help you solve the problem. It's another thing to actually accomplish the shift in the frame of mind. And, and, and in my experience, some of these problems are so challenging that, that you do need an actual discipline, a pra something you practice at every day. Um, now, I gather, so there's two kinds of things. I mean, there are ac kinds of activities that are more atelic, that is, without goal, um, mm -hmm. like just taking a walk, if you're just taking a walk, you're taking a walk. Uh, but then there are also things that do have a goal. Um, you know, you're writing something to finish it. And, and in principle, um, you can approach either of those more or less mindfully, right? I, I, I mean, uh, I mean, you, you would like to be more mindful about telic activities as well, uh, in a way that presu presumably does not impede performance, you know, since that's yeah, the point. Yeah. It, but, but that's a fair. Yeah. I think so. So I think that's very helpful. I mean, I think the idea of mindfulness. Um, so one sort of meaning of it, or one I, a kind of interpretation of it is, is, uh, has to do with attention and so sort of doing things attentively. And, um, in that sense, telic activities can be, can be pursued more or less mindfully. Um, so what I'm interested in is not is not just the attentiveness, but the capacity to sort of attend specifically to the atelic activities in a way that enables uh, us to appreciate them more fully. But you're right that that um, mindfulness in the sense of attentiveness can be directed at, at mm -hmm. telic activities also. People sometimes also, I mean, this is, this is different from mindfulness, but but um, people sometimes uh, connect 
the, the kind of atelic activities with mm-hmm. flow activities. So ones in which your, your sort of mind is running along and fe- feels unimpeded. And, um, right. But actually flow can happen in both. You can have a kind of often the, right. the kind of flow experience is in fact happening in a telic activity where you're, you're extremely seamlessly moving from step to step and goal to goal. So I, I think both the flow experience and, and mindfulness as attention sort of cut across this mm-hmm. distinction. Yeah. The, um, now I said you take pains to, uh, separate, your your view some part from parts of Buddhism. I mean, the, the term mindfulness comes from Buddhism, uh, or it's a translation of a, of a Buddhist term. Um, yeah. And uh, the part you uh, the the part you want to separate yourself from is the not self idea in Buddhism. The idea that the self doesn't exist and and appreciation of that fact, seeing that, experiencing it, uh, is liberation. Uh, and then kind of. In a way that I think is related, actually, uh, you're skeptical of Eckhart Tolle's claim, something about the way, how strongly he puts the claim that if you are completely in the moment, if you are completely in the present, you can, I think he's saying you almost can't help but be happy, or maybe he's saying you can be perfectly happy. It's some kind of extreme claim. Um, I do, I will say, I mean, I'm basically, I have sympathy for both (laughs) those positions, but I, I have talked to a couple of people who seem to have gotten to a place through meditation that's just I, I don't think I'll ever get to. But they say that, uh, you know, they have let go of the self and that they are kind of perennially um, happy. And I, I think Eckhart Tolle, although he, he didn't he, he had a spontaneous awakening according by his account i think he didn't like do it through arduous meditation but i i I think what he has would be described as a not self experience um but anyway you are you are careful not to go this far (laughs) that's yeah it's interesting to connect those two because maybe the more radical sense that being in the now um is a kind of panacea maybe if if what was happening in experience was a kind of no self yeah uh, experience it, it would be more radical so i'm very much open to the idea that something sort of conditional that if the no self doctrine were true or if we could if, if what was happening was appreciating the non-existence of the self that might that would be more radical mm-hmm. than the kind of use of meditation to just appreciate the ongoing atelic activities um it's just that the i'm skeptical that the more radical interpretations of what the no self view comes to the sort of um the idea that that really the right way to think about the metaphysics of the self is in terms of of um, sort of mm-hmm. ownerless mental events is actually a credible view. I mean, I know you have a view about this on which you have an interpretation of of something in the no self ballpark or of the sort of on which it's less um, radical than that. Uh, and so, there's an interesting question: whether there are sort of positions in between um, rejecting the sort of the most radical versions of the no self view on the one hand, and um, uh, accepting that um, I don't exist, yeah. period, well, on the other hand. So so th- there's room to explore that. Yeah. I mean, what I've argued is that there's reason to believe that the Buddha himself had a less radical, uh, that he wasn't positing a metaphysical doctrine when he talked about not-self, and it was more of a therapeutic, uh, almost prescription that said there's no doubt that that the full-fledged metaphysical version of it became part of buddha's thought and and i guess if there's a connection between this complete uh submersion in the moment and contentment on the one hand and not self on the other hand i think it may be related to this that you know in mindfulness and interestingly, if you look at the ancient mindfulness text, there's actually no discussion of, of living in the moment. That has uh-huh. that that has become part of the kind of modern trappings of, of the idea. I mean, I think it's a legitimate trapping in the sense that if you do what what is prescribed in the ancient mindfulness text, you will be a, you will be in the moment. And, and one part of, of of that part of being in the moment, I think, is um, letting go of what you know is the term is tanha in buddhism it's the it's the craving either for something you don't have or to be rid of something you do have it's it's mm-hmm. desire and aversion and and i think 
if you imagine a world in which there is none of that, you've totally let go of that. And I'm convinced that some of these people get pretty close to that through really arduous discipline. If you imagine a world in which you, 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 you view everything without either desire or aversion, I, I think the, the argument, well, I, I think what may be the case is that a lot of the glue that holds your conception of the self together is gone. That a lot of, I mean, after all, both desire and aversion come from the point of view of a person. These are the interests of a, a locus. Mm -hmm. And there's a philosopher I talk about in this in this book I wrote about this who who who, who argues that uh, the very you know if you let go of this this tanha the desire and the aversion the bounds of the self naturally collapse because the construction of the bounds of self is a product of those things in a certain sense so that that's what I would imagine but I'm not one of these people who is who has been there so to speak so that's kind of conjectural. Yeah, I mean, I'm very, I mean, I find it very intriguing and it's very interesting to try and think about the, the kind of experiences you're describing and what they mean exactly. Because, I mean, so one way to think about the, the, the way I approach sort of self-help in the book is that it's sort of abstract cognitive therapy. The thought is, what, what are ways in which our emotional adjustment to the world might depend, uh, not for instance, on cognitive errors about um, your parents, but kind of systemic cognitive errors, like confusions about the, the world. And so there's mm -hmm. one way to read the sort of Buddhist idea on which um, it's really crucial that there be a kind of cognitive core to, that there's some kind of, when there's an, the idea that there's a kind of illusion of self that is the basis of suffering really has to be cashed out in terms of, uh, there's a kind of metaphysical doctrine that uh, we're attached to that's wrong. And, uh, that's the interpretation that I find um, that I'm most wary of because I, I find it very hard to, to I can see how, as it were, if the if the the radical metaphysics were true, the, the sort of no self metaphysics were true, it would have these profound emotional consequences. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure it's true. Then there's the question: Well, suppose it's not true, or what, what to make of the experiences you're describing? Mm -hmm. People who through meditation achieve a kind of radically different relationship to their own desires and their attachments to themselves and their own life and the lives of others. Um, how to, what kinds of morals to draw as a philosopher thinking about the sort of arguments for the no self view or the metaphysics of the no self view from the fact that sort of, sort of reverse engineering, like should, should we think, well, if this emotional experience is possible, um, maybe that's a, evidence that there is some kind of metaphysical revelation it's just that we're not getting it because you can't get it just by looking at the arguments um and i'm not sure what to think about that I, but like you I, i'm not even remotely close to having those kinds of experiences yeah well i guess i i'd say here's just one final kind of defense of not self which is this it's almost in a, in a more pragmatic spirit than a metaphysical spirit but it's this okay let's say that look Neither self nor not self is true in the sense that I can I can be like I am now and I perceive a self and it's there. Or I could go through all these meditative disciplines that would lead my sense of self to uh, dissolve. And yeah. both of those would be apprehensions I'm having. In one moment I had a self apparently and in one moment I didn't. Which is better? Well, <clears throat> I think the argument here would be... Um, in, le in deconstructing the self, in letting go of the desires and aversions, I have actually clarified my view of the world. And I think you can make an, an actually very strong argument there invoking, you know, contemporary psychology and so on. That it's, it's actually a clearer, more objective view of the world if you don't have desires and aversions that are from your point of view. It's more like the point of view of the universe. And uh, so that's a sense, that's a kind of a pragmatic defense of the, of, of, of what might have sounded like a metaphysical doctrine, which is that the reason we can call not self enlightenment is because it actually leads to clearer ver uh, view of things. I mean, the so that's really interesting. I mean, I I think I mean one kind of question about about the emotional sort of impact of the no self view is whether, for instance, um, it's it's supposed to y yield a kind of 
um, equanimity about death or the, the sort of attachment to others. I mean, the thing I find it hardest to see is how the kind of adjustment you're describing in which, for instance, I come to see uh, everyone as equal. Or I kind of c- come to think uh, my particular perspective is no more is not privileged over other people's. Um, OK, that's one kind of uh, possible revelation. Um, uh, so we, we could talk about whether that is the right way to see things. But suppose it was. It's still it's not clear to me how that would yield by itself would yield a kind of detachment from um, kind of equanimity about the end of my own existence or an ability to be to, to sort of a change in my attitude to, for instance, bereavement or loss. So the, the, I, I think there's still something sort of more that I'm, I'm yeah, well, looking well, for. Well, let me say, first of all, I'm not just talking about clarifying your moral vision per se, uh, although I think it would do that if you let go of the self. Uh, but but I think also we make uh, warped judgments about people by virtue of our selfish perspective. Like like once we've categorized someone as enemy or friend and we start evaluating their behavior, we act that actually influences the the uh, our hypotheses about why they did things. Why did he do a good thing or why did he do a bad thing? The answer we give depends on whether it's a friend or enemy. And so it actually influences your your you know uh your your description of the world and your hypotheses about the way the world works and why things happen. So I just want to be clear, I'm not just talking about uh an objective moral point of view, but but an actual truer yeah. view of the world. Now as for it's funny that you should say it's not clear to you um how that makes death easier. Well, if you're not atta- you know, if you've let go of all preferences, uh you know, that includes the preference in principle to be alive. I mean, if you've really let go of desire and aversion, the aversion to death uh, fades. And and the reason I say I'm surprised is because the more common objection is, doesn't this lead to nihilism? Don't you cease to care about anything? I see. I think I wasn't. Under, so I, I was I think I was I was uh, imagining that we that um, we weren't going for nihilism because there were still going to be preferences. And I was thinking, well, surely I would still prefer. Mm-hmm. Even if I've achieved a sort of detached perspective on my own life in relation to others, I would still prefer that people not die if their right. lives are decent. And I would prefer myself not to die. Uh, if the picture is something more radical, namely giving up on preference altogether, you're right. Then, then the worry is the is the yeah. the one you just pointed to, namely that um, yeah. it seems uh, kind of nihilistic. I mean, what, what, one of the I mean, part of what I was thinking about the the, the sort of metaphysical interpretation of the no self view. Was that um, the idea was was something like um, uh, you know the mind is sort of made up of these ownerless mental events. Some of them are preferences. That's fine, but um, the idea that there's anything, any one right. substance that in, that instantiates them is an illusion. So, insofar as um, you have preferences for people to be better off, kind of loving kindness, that makes sense. But insofar as you have a kind of attachment that involves a kind of unwillingness to let go, the idea would be to sort of trace that to a kind of inflated metaphysics of substance. But my, I guess my thought is, in, in order to reject that, you really had, would have to be quite radical. I mean, here's a kind of common sense picture. Um, you and I are a certain kind of animal. We're human beings. Human beings are, like every other animal in the relevant sense of substance, they have all kinds of properties, mental and physical. And I, I think on the radical no self view, it's not just a denial of um, a kind of unified mental self or something. It's it's the denial of of the sort of basic picture uh, on which um, when I say I, I'm referring to this you know organism. Um, and and I guess I think if that was really true, if when I go around saying I am hungry, that's just not true because I doesn't refer. To anything i should really just say there is hunger that's hunger mm-hmm. i would think that that is a very radical view and i think if i can see how if that was my view i would in a way think yeah i, I shouldn't be worried about death because i don't <laughs> i'm already dead i don't even exist in the sense the thing i was afraid of namely mm-hmm. me not existing that's just already true um so anyway that, that's a kind of way of interpreting the no self view that i feel like i i have an idea why it's radical and um, and why its radicalness would lead to this sort of detachment 
but but leave in place sort of preference and loving kindness and you want there to be more pleasant events. So. I certainly think that's one rendering of it, and I certainly think yeah. it's commonly rendered as a metaphysical truth that's not merely pragmatic in 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 the sense I just described it or in other ways I've described it. I I, I think that's fair, um, and I and I think what you do in the final chapter makes sense for your uh, for your purposes. I mean, for purposes of like people going through a midlife crisis, just be more mindful uh, is good advice. Uh, and don't don't get wrapped up uh, too much in in, uh, in in this not self question. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, and as for death, I mean, you're right. Uh, I don't know many people who have meditated so long and hard that death is not an issue at all, and uh, 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 and and that's a, a tough one. And although you deal with death a little in the book, I think you'd probably agree it's less closely associated with the midlife crisis per se. Then with a crisis, somebody my age should be experiencing right now. Although I have to say, I actually don't think about death, but I should be, I guess, getting closer. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I mean, death <laughs> is one of those case, one of those cases where I feel like some people find the kind of philosophical therapies for death, like thinking about prenatal non-existence or things like that, find them helpful. I have to admit that as someone who who does think too much about death, it's a case where, unlike thinking about missing out or ex- obsession with projects. The philosophical treatments for fear of death seem they don't quite uh, they don't hit the spot for me. Right. So if you're not thinking about it, I, I would say yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I know you do in the book get into the prenatal thing. where like, hey, being dead's no worse than not being born. That yeah. wasn't a bad time, was it? But but uh, yeah. but but yeah. Uh, but I agree. The less you think about it, the better uh, for, for most of us. Um, and in any event, if you're still blessedly in midlife, you probably don't need to think about it uh, much at all. Uh, if you've been lucky health wise. So anyway, thanks for writing this. It's really it's it's very like I said, readable, witty, uh midlife a philosophical guide, Princeton University Press, um and uh a good a good Christmas present, I'm sure. And the, the thought yeah, that has no you. doubt occurred to you. Uh thank you. That would be great. Pe- people told me that uh that sometimes they were reluctant to give it to people because they didn't want to implicate that their the, the target of the gift was in midlife. So I should say I'm understanding midlife very, uh, very expansively. Well, yeah, I, and if you I, give I, it to surprised. people, give it to people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, yeah. and it's a compliment. It's flattering. Yeah, it surprised yeah. me that you would you would, you would uh, deny that you're in midlife. I feel like the 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 the, the, the I, I was very quick to identify with midlife. I leapt for the label as soon as I could. But I feel like in general. People also then afterwards cling on to it for as long as they can. So um, oh, I'm still I'm still attached to it. Yes. Good. Good. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in late late midlife, where I plan to remain forever. Excellent. That sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Karen. This was fun. Thank you very much.